Well, I've now had three glasses. Unlike what most people think, it isn't actually the alcohol itself which makes you drunk. Rather, as soon as the alcohol enters your body, there are a series, a cascade of chemical reactions. And it's the byproduct of one of these reactions, the fatty acid compounds, which actually make you drunk. Well, I've had well over a bottle of wine now, and although I feel pretty good, my act reaction time isn't exactly what it should be. We'll try testing it. <laughs> well, it's uh, about a quarter of a second, slower than before. There's a good reason why my reactions are sluggish. The normal chemical balance in my brain is being disrupted as those fatty acids clog up the surface of the neurons. The fatty acids attack only parts of my brain, including those that control my speech, my mood, and my memory. What was I saying? Well, what was I saying? Alcohol just influences behavior. Some people just get belligerent. belligerent. Others, uh, no, wait a minute. I can I can't remember terribly what I'm going to say. <laughs> what was I saying? Alcohol also influences behaviour. Where's the coffee? Sorry? Well, I just say action and I'll be on the ball. Action! I, I'm not sure I can get my head round this completely now. Literally. How can all my thoughts and behaviour come from a collection of chemicals and little neurons? Some people compare the brain to a computer, but I think it's much more like a termite mound. It's all to do with the whole thing being greater than the sum of its parts. A termite colony is extraordinary. It is as intricate and as complex as a city. It can dominate whole areas of the bush and wage war against other insects. Above all, it can build these stupendous structures with columns and buttresses and air conditioning ducts. So where is the knowledge for this incredible organization kept? Not in an individual worker termite. They are supremely dim with a brain the size of a pinhead. Nor in the enormous, squirming, egg-producing queen. Her brain is even smaller than a worker's. No, the intricate behavior of the termite colony emerges from the collective effort of all the termites. Here, a group of worker termites are constructing a new wall. Not a single one of them carries a blueprint for the wall, but working together, it gets built termites send out chemical signals and between them they pile up their tiny mouthfuls of mud. Clearly the human brain is totally different from a termite mound. Both are composed of numerous building blocks, either neurons or termites. Each, when acting in harmony, is capable of extraordinary feats. It makes no sense to search for the root of knowledge in single neurons in the brain or, for that matter, in one termite in a colony. The success of both depends on many millions of simple units working together. So, it's teams of neurons acting in unison that give us all our skills. Each team, based in a particular region of the brain, takes on a different responsibility. From our most advanced human abilities, such as language and memory, to the more basic ones, like movement.
Because we walk, run and reach without thinking, we forget how such incredible precision is possible. To see just how much brain effort is required, look what happens when we're plunged into a totally new environment. Okay. Okay, there we go. Thank you. Astronauts have to learn to move from scratch when they enter a world without gravity. The reason why we're able to learn new tasks and carry them out automatically lies here. It's a part of the brain called the cerebellum, or little brain, because it sticks out right at the base of the brain proper. Here are stored the practice movements we all learn, be it riding a bike, playing the piano, or even fixing a satellite. The astronauts are in the cargo bay of the shuttle, but they're not out in space. This is the closest they can get to space back on Earth, an enormous swimming pool, a pool so large that four space shuttles can fit inside it. Here, astronauts can practice their tasks over and over again until they can move automatically without thinking. I had to jiggle it a little bit to get it to walk. And it is finicky about being directly perpendicular to the rail when it goes on. So try to wiggle it back and forth from starboard to port and also from forward to aft. Okay. We're also assuming that the latches in, on board didn't work. So they're manually. Marsha Ivins is one such astronaut. Talk about seeing the world. She's been on four shuttle missions and orbited the planet 683 times. Learning to deal with the absence of gravity takes a little bit of getting used to. We are, are used to walking from place to place when we go someplace, and you don't walk, you float or fly. So when I want to go from here to across the room or across the cabin, I will push off with my hand or my feet. If I push off too hard, I smash into the wall. If I don't push off in the right direction, I miss the wall. And if I don't push off hard enough, I don't quite get to the wall. So that takes a little bit of getting used to. Once we've practiced a skill enough, the cerebellum can take over automatically. A thought starts it off, and then the cerebellum does the work, sending out instructions to the rest of the body. This happens without us even being aware of it. In fact, the unconscious part of the brain is often more skillful than the conscious part. On the space shuttle is a robot arm. The astronauts have to train hard to operate it using a joystick. But the secret with moving the robot arm smoothly is not to think too much about it. Let the cerebellum take over. For me to learn to use the arm, it was difficult to think about moving each joint as I moved it. And finally, one instructor said, just do it. Just put your hands on the controls and move it. And I just did it. And I, I don't even know how that works, and it, it got there. And the more experience you get, the more rotations and translations you can make at the same time. And that's probably true of learning to use your hand. You know, when you reach for something, you make very complex motions with your arm, and that's probably as learned a response as it is learning to control the robot arm in here. The astronauts use the same mental equipment to control the robot arm as we first use as babies to control our flesh and blood arms. People have a fantastic ability to make almost any tool an extension of their bodies. As an infertility doctor, I make full use of my cerebellum to perform keyhole surgery. Here, I'm investigating why a woman is unable to conceive. The surgical tools allow me to examine inside her without resorting to major surgery. After enough training, it's relatively simple for me to coordinate what I do with my hands with what I see on the screen. Truth is, that this surgical manipulation, like all surgical manipulation, looks incredibly skilled and very intricate. But actually, most of the time you're doing...